Well, the greatest life lesson I learned was about seven weeks ago when I fell unconscious in the uh, change rooms at the beach club. And I was uh, gone for all money. I My heart started beating at 300 a minute. I had a, basically a cardiac arrest. And I didn't know what was happening. The last thing I remember is just feeling terribly dizzy and then being woken up by people saying, Tony, you've just had a heart attack. And um, about 9% of people that have this survived. So what it's taught me is to do the things now, um, do the things now that you love, that you enjoy, that you've been putting off all your life. And I hope that my lesson sends a message out to the people that are listening. Don't wait. That was Tony Arena, an incredible guy. And I say incredible because it's not only the first challenge he's had in his life, it is he's had a life of challenges. And what I respect with Tony is his ability to bounce back from challenges and then to look back and reflect on those challenges as a learning experience and then taking the learnings forward uh, in the rest of his life. And he's done this throughout his career. This episode is a reflection on Tony's career and on how he's helped his mental health and how he's helped the mental health of others. So we're going to be talking about men's mental health, which also is applicable to women's mental health. And you're going to hear Tony's version of his story, his life events, and his top tips uh, to that help him, that can also help others. And so this is another insightful episode of Me and My Health Up. I'm your host, Anthony Harcher, a clinical nutritionist and lifestyle medicine specialist. So here it is. Welcome, Tony. Welcome to the Me and My Health Up podcast. How are you today? Yeah, I'm well. Uh, thanks, Anthony, for the podcast. Oh, it's so great to have you on. You know, we we go way back, and uh, you you're a great uh, storyteller and a man of um, plenty of wisdom to pass on uh, to um, uh, to help with, I guess, the mental health of. Uh, um, Anyone out there that's uh, that may be struggling, you certainly got some uh, good tips to share with us today. I think you're getting carried away calling me wise, but uh, anyway, I'll, we'll see how we go. We'll see if I can. I might say something wise here, but thankfully you're recording it, so I'll, I'll listen to it later and maybe even learn from it myself. <laughs> um, maybe the grey hairs is uh, g- giving away the wisdom, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> I, um, yeah, but for the um, the listeners who don't know you, um, please uh, sh- share a little bit about yourself. Yeah, okay. So I started out my career. Um, I studied arts law, went into law, and pretty soon I was doing criminal law. They say you never choose. Sometimes you never choose the job. The job chooses you. I was sitting down, uh, unemployed lawyer, and I got a call from uh, the Aboriginal Legal Service in Nowra, and they said, um oh, look, we're looking for a lawyer. And I thought, oh, finally, someone's discovered me. And they know that I'm waiting here to start my brilliant career. Little did I know that um, they were going through the unemployed list of lawyers. My name was A and I was at the top. So I started with A and alphabetical order. They were ringing through these lawyers, hired me and a guy called uh, Alexander. Um, So they knocked two A's off the top of the list and I started working down at Nowra with the Aboriginal Legal Service. And I did that for six months and thoroughly enjoyed criminal law. And then I went to uh, work at Public Solicitor after that in Sydney and um, pretty well two or three years after that, I left um, to go to the bar and I became a criminal barrister. And that was my career for about six years. In 1987, I left to become an broker. And you got any stories to share around your criminal criminal barrister days? Is there a is there a, a particular case that uh, stood out for you? Look, I was. Um, I'll tell you, I was doing a lot of um, 
murder cases, eventually I was elevated somehow up to the Supreme Court section. So I, I can't tell you, I don't want to upset your listeners. They might be listening to this at the wrong um, time of the day, but all sorts of uh, gruesome crimes. I, um, you know, I uh, appeared for someone who um, put an axe through his mate's head while he was sitting in the bath because he, they argued about the home bill. I had uh, people arguing in drunken brawls. I had um, uh, mothers charged with um, the murder of their baby and they were totally innocent. So to uncover the facts there and try and provide justice for someone was really um, fulfilling. And I just loved the excitement of the criminal trial defending somebody you know the 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 great question i was always asked was how do you defend someone when you're guilty and i would always say um so i never afford myself that luxury of um uh committing out my client is guilty if i conclude the client is guilty who else has he got in the world or she so my uh, role was to um, just defend before the court the, to the best of my ability. And so, um, you know, Anthony, uh, talking about what you learn in life lessons, uh, uh, my first bit of training taught me to be, uh, to take the other point of view. Lawyers are always trained to screen and test propositions, and this can work very well in the courtroom. It doesn't necessarily work outside the courtroom. And when I went into sales, I, um, well, I realized that the whole point of selling wasn't to argue with your come up or find the alternative viewpoint, but it was to try and get on with your come up. So I don't know how long it took me to retrain myself in that regard, but I'm going to call myself today fully converted. My law really helps me in, in business because it does still force me to you know, screen and test propositions and not just accept things as I see them. But I've also had to learn to, to be a, a salesman as a business broker. That's what I do. And it's probably what I've experienced being um, or working with you alongside you in the um, in the growth rooms, which we'll get onto. But, uh, you know, I, I always saw you as a person that could relate to all levels. Uh, so, and I think it's probably stems from those criminal barristers days when you said, um, you know, in order to best defend them, you had to get along with them and really understand them and who they are and, you um, and you know, um, build a friendship, so to speak, so to really you know get into the um, uh, put the best case forward uh, on their behalf. So, I think I think it served you well in terms of them being able to um, help uh, men who are struggling with their mental health uh, to relate to them. And uh, and I think you need that ability to relate to someone before they will listen. And you're very good at that. I could always see that come across if you're defending someone you do have to get their confidence it's like with a client in the the real world today i i have to get that person's confidence but um a, a criminal defendant uh someone who's charged with an offense they need to be able to tell you what went on they need to be able to trust you they need to be able to work with you to the end and and that relationship that you're forming early on is very important i think anthony whatever we're doing the importance of the relationship is is enormous and it's just about it's just about everything when you're talking about your family or business or or a one-on-one -on -one relationship uh with a customer that trust if they trust you they'll come with you and what have you found that's worked well for you around developing trust in relationships and building that rapport? You know, the first five minutes of meeting I have with a new client is all about listening, trying to find out what's going on in that person's life, trying to find out why they're there. And really, I started to ask myself the questions, you know, and I, am I going to be of assistance here? Once I find out what the pain is, what the problem is, what, what we need to overcome, 
then I can start delivering on my experience, my, my solutions. But unless I know what the problem is, I can't solve it. I can't start solving it. So the answer is really, yeah, it's just, it's just listening. It's just being empathetic and, and listening to what people are saying. And it's probably what, uh, you know, in terms of when I was working with you in this growth room, you know, I saw you as a very effective facilitator uh, based on, I guess, those skills that you just mentioned that you've developed over these years. Uh, so um, you want to tell us a bit more about uh, this growth room that I keep <laughs> alluding to uh, and uh, and how people uh, can create this in their, uh, in, in their uh, social circles. Um, you know, how could they facilitate the power of what we got out of uh, the growth room working together and uh, communicating listening talking conversing um, how, how could people do this in their everyday lives well it was a great lesson and we're, now we're talking about the growth rooms of the, the Banksia project when you and I first met we were trained as facilitators we weren't trained as psychiatrists or psychologists or even counsellors. We were just trained in some fairly basic skills to listen to people, to not judge people, to allow people to get things off their chest that they wanted to get off their chest. Uh, and the beautiful uh, therapy of simply someone talking about what's going on in their life in a group of their peers. The growth room, as, as you know, as we were co-facilitators in this room, was a wonderful opportunity for people to safely say what's going on in, in their life without someone jumping in and saying, oh, really, is that what happened to you? Or, you know, that's, um, you shouldn't be like that. Or why don't you go and do this? We didn't judge. We didn't offer advice. We just, the rubber was that people, could almost solve their own problem or get on the path of solving the problem, talking about it in a safe environment. And what we learnt was that this old myth of men not talking is just not right. Men will talk. It's just that the typical environments men find them in with other men where they're expected to match up or with women, where they're expected to match up to certain expectations or certain role models that have been ground into them from the earliest of ages um, leaves men often fenceless when they fail. And what these men learnt was to fail wasn't that bad. And that was the magic, the simple magic of people coming together. Now you say, how can people use that in their lives? Well, we've all got friends. And the last thing we want to become is someone's, you know, counsellor, always giving people advice. But I think if you've got your eyes and ears open, you can see someone who's struggling and can handle that very gently. And if you think they need a friend, just gently offer the hand out. Say, look, if ever you want to talk, talk. Now, not everyone will respond to that. But at least if they know you're there, you might be the only person in their life that year that's offered that. They, they, may, they may have a friend, but not a friend that they can talk to like that. And so I think that's what we can do in our everyday life. Just keep, keep aware, watch out, don't barge into people's lives, but be there if you can offer a helping hand. What what are the key, uh, I guess, signals uh, that someone should be looking out for in terms of this awareness? Because uh, you mentioned, you know, be aware. Are there any telltale signals that someone might be giving away in terms of they need help and uh, that's the time to uh, check in with them? Uh, yeah, of course, we had it easy in the growth rooms. We just told guys, talk about your issues so we didn't have to, be too detective, did we, in our in our as facilitators or even as fellow members of the room? But oh, look, I suppose if someone changes their um, 
to me no with you or they don't talk to you as much or they don't talk where they normally would be turning up or they're not laughing as much as they normally would or you know that in their business let, let's say now right in the in the middle of this pandemic you might have knowledge about what that person's going through as far as their business is concerned a lot of people are having to turn their life upside down and we'll talk a little bit more about this later on as well so a lot of people are having to revalue what it is that they should be doing in their life and revalue their life really and so there's not necessarily an answer to that problem that you can provide but you can at least dig a little bit and um and just be there for somebody but if you know you can maybe gently probe and say, look, how are things going? How are things going in your business? And or how are things going at home? And they'll talk to you. If it's, if it's the right relationship, you might get a – and you'd be surprised. Once, once the doors open, the floodgates are open, and suddenly you might be uh, talking to that person on a regular basis, maybe even offering a helping hand maybe giving money, maybe then giving advice if they say to you something like, I don't know what I'm going to do. That's a little more of an opening for you to say, well, let's look at let's look at the options here. What what do you want to do? What, what's open to you? And the other thing the uh, growth room really helped facilitate was creating that safe space that you alluded to earlier. And I, I think, you know, often in modern Western world, we are very busy and we have appointments after appointments. And I, I, I think it's not a very good timing in, in terms of, you know, if, if you notice these signals that someone's a bit off and not themselves, to then approach the subject and then realizing you've got a meeting, you know, five minutes after you've asked the question uh, and not having that nice time uh, to allow to hear them out. Because uh, I think that, you know, often if someone, feels that you're rushed or not in a state to receive what they want to tell you, then they won't tell you uh, because they just think, I don't want to pr- trouble you. You look, you look seem busy. So and I, what I really loved about that growth room is we actually all came there for a common you know, reason to uh, help our mental health and we'd all be open about where we were at and uh, we had the time to hear people out and everyone had equal time. So what are your comments around creating that safe space or approaching the subject at the right time? Well, you can do it. You can do it formally. If there's a group of men that meet, let's just take the men situation. Women can do this as well, and it can be mixed. Um, a guy that I know who was a public speaker and a compare, he told me about something that happened over his way in the eastern suburbs. and. I told him about the growth rooms and he says, look, we do this now informally. A couple of us lost some close mates and we all started questioning. What's it all about? What are we all striving for? So they just meet at the pub. But it's not to talk about football. It may be to talk about football. But at some stage in that meeting, they they unload. And the others listen. So that's an informal growth room. And there's so many forms of that Anthony out there. The the one that we um, had experience of was one particular formal setup. But you can have informal setups um, where where people that normally have uh, a group or a get together or a gathering turn one of those into um, let's talk about what's going on in your life. And that that introduction of a safe space for a it might be a mate or it might be someone you've never considered a mate, but someone who gives you the clue might say, "Look, I'm really suffering. And the people I feel for, I mean, I'm a business broker. It's it's a stress on me if I don't get the job done. If I say I'm going to sell someone's business and I can't sell it, that's stressful." Any doctor who's looking after a patient, any nurse looking after a patient, you, you've got clients that you look after their wellness. 
there's pressure on all of us in those situations to deliver. And we might wake up in the middle of the night thinking about a client or a case. So we don't necessarily clock off at five o'clock. Anybody who's responsible for someone else in this world, professionally or otherwise, has that person's welfare on their mind. And they're the people that I'd be looking to help as much as possible in this environment. Now, can you imagine what's going on in our hospital system right now? I go to Twitter and I listen to the doctors and the and the nurses and they just they're just about spent. But you know, they're so devoted to their job that some of them have to quit under the pressure, but some of them just keep, you know, plugging away. And I really have admiration for those people. So yeah, the growth rooms were a fantastic learning experience for us. And I think the other thing that worked really well around the growth rooms was that regular time that we're committed to one another to meeting uh, and, you know, a, a turning up every time uh, at that time uh, of that month. Um, and like, because you can think about like, like you mentioned that the scenario of those mates that met at the pub, they probably had a certain you know, they meet once a week or once a fortnight. But it, it is that having that prioritise really helps your mental health, you know, having that space where you can talk freely uh, and openly without, you know, getting any judgement or um, and having those people there to support you and listen and uh, and to, uh, yeah, really, you know, there, there, there is support and listeners Um and they don't necessarily have to have the answers. Uh, it's just more being able to be heard and listened to and uh, uh, supported. So I, I think that was the other thing that really helped uh, was having that frequency um, and that's really that preventative time or that investment into the mental gym, so to speak. Um, it, like, you know, yeah, yeah. Look, um it's been wonderful for me because I've, I've gone on then and created other – right at the end of um, that first year, I went and did a mental health first aid course. If anyone's listening to this and thinks that you don't need mental health first aid training yourself, think again because the – just a bit like CPR course, mental health first aid teaches you what to look for and teaches you what to do if you strike it. Now, if you do strike someone in trouble, it'll teach you how to gently, all, all the things we learned in our, in our rooms, gently approach it, find out what's going on, and when necessary, refer to the professional. And it's so easy to do one of these courses. I mean, CPR could save someone's life, and so could mental health first aid. And Australia's a leader in the world in teaching Mental Health First Aid is taught in so many countries and it was just born in little old Melbourne, Australia. Um, so I heartily recommend that. And then I, um, I went on to create a website called mentalhealthpolicy.com.au for people who want to just go in and download a template. See, in the workplace, the workplace, and I know that some workplaces are much more advanced than this, but many workplaces... Uh, take it to this level, they say, oh, well, if someone is in mental health, if they're struggling, we'll call in the uh, employee assistance program and we'll, 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 call, we'll, we'll call someone in when it's too late. So I think that and the disruption of people working at home has thrown this all out too, Anthony, but the workplace is where some people are either totally happy or totally unhappy. Um, and in between is about the rest of the 70%. So most most people are unhappy in their work, unfortunately. That's the worldwide studies. And that doesn't mean necessarily that you need a mental health solution to that, but quite often thinking about the people that you employ to the level of trying to make that as, as enjoyable and as stress-free uh, as possible, um, you need a mental health policy. 
which is a proactive approach to mental health in the workplace. And what, what, what is fundamental around that mental health policy? So what would you say would be the top three things that a workplace should be doing for their employees? Um, first, again, go back to the earlier question. Being aware, being alert, watching for changes, uh, taking opportunities to find out about your people, whether they're happy. Um, so they have two lives. They have life outside the workplace and life inside the workplace. And the employer has much more control over what happens inside the workplace. But the, the, the employer can assist with what might be happening outside because it's the one person. You're still dealing with the one person. So I'd say awareness. I would say um, make the workplace more fun and enjoyable, having regular games and regular get-togethers and regular non-work activities to do. And I suppose, thirdly, you know, just really understanding who it is that you're employing. And if you were to draw a list up of the six main things that that employee does in your workplace, and ask that person to score each of those activities on a one to 10 for enjoyment. And if you find out that the six things that someone's doing in your workplace they hate doing, guess what? Your productivity is about, your productivity level for that employee is about 10%. If you can bump those scores up a bit and maybe even cancel some of those activities and find other activities, in other words, what's this person good at? And am I utilizing that? in their role. It's not the thing that comes on a CV. On a CV is I can do Excel and I'm well organized and I'm, you know, I can work on my own and autonomously, all that stuff. But how about finding out about the person? So when I advise anybody about drawing up their CV, first thing I say is I can't see the person here. Who's the person that I'm going to employ? Give me the right person and I can train that person. But if you're the wrong person for the job, nothing of training is going to help that person become a productive employee. That's basically it. Yeah, so it's really making sure the human comes out in the resume as opposed to uh, just, a, I guess, uh, you know, letters on a page, so to speak. Um, oh, yeah. There's that Look, human, you, you can yeah. tick off all those boxes. I can tell you the 20 things that most resumes or CVs have and it's all about you know what they're good at but but really so the last 10 resumes that I read but who are you who who's what, what's this person that's going to be part of my organization tell me about tell me about you tell me about how you how you tick and where you perform best Yeah, I'll include a, the link um, to the uh, mental health uh, policy that you mentioned uh, in the show notes so that uh, listeners can, can go directly uh, to the link and uh, download um, that template, uh, which they can then create their own mental health policy. So uh, that's a, um, a great uh, great resource um, for particularly employers um, and then for employees, it's uh, making sure you uh, do your resume so that it's um, it. It's, it's actually telling the employer who you are, actually are, uh, what you love doing um, and who you are as a person and as opposed to just all your achievements um, and uh, yeah. what you're great at. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, achievements and skills, but now tell me who you are. And from all this, um, Tony, in terms of your growth room, your uh, background as a criminal lawyer, um, barrister, then into a uh, business broker, what has really, um, you know, changed for you? Like what would you say that you've taken away as key life lessons, so to speak, uh, out of that journey? Well, the greatest life lesson I learned was about seven weeks ago when I fell unconscious in the uh, change rooms at the beach club and I was uh, gone for all money. I my heart started beating at 300 a minute. I had a, basically a cardiac arrest. And 
I didn't know what was happening. The last thing I remember is just feeling terribly dizzy and then being woken up by people saying, Tony, you've just had a heart attack. It wasn't strictly a heart attack because a heart attack is from the other side, the, the plumbing, if you like, the arteries that carry the blood to the heart. This was just a, a freak event with the rhythm of my heart. And um, about 9% of people that have this survive. So again, Anthony, on the first aid side, there was someone luckily coming into the sheds that saw this. And they went and grabbed the biggest, toughest guy in the club to try and break my chest by doing CPR. And he almost uh, succeeded. Uh, seven weeks later, I'm still... I'm still a little bit sore, but I'm grateful that he made me so sore because he saved my life and he saved my brain by pushing the blood around into my brain to make sure that I didn't have any brain damage and then waited for the defibrillator to arrive, which was handy. So if you talk about luck, the people that were around me saved me. I'm, you know, obviously eternally grateful that they were there and they had the expertise um, to be able to bring me back to consciousness uh, with the assistance of the defibrillator. And now, seven weeks later, I don't know if anyone listening has had um, that experience, but what we've been talking about just in this conversation, Anthony, is, is all about, you know, helping people and finding out who you are as a person and what it's taught me is that life, you're not, we're not going to live forever. We might not be there till the end of the year. We might not be there till the end of the weekend. You just don't know. And how often in our lives do we say, I'll do that when, you know, when the time's right. Oh, look, I've got plenty of time to do that. Well, you may have plenty of time, but you may not have a lot of time and if I can imagine that I hadn't been brought back what things would I have regretted that I hadn't done on the basis of oh you've got plenty of time to do that so what it's taught me is to do the things now um, do the things now that you love that you enjoy that you've been putting off all your life and I hope that my lesson sends a message out to the people that are listening, don't wait. Don't wait till the time's right. Don't wait till necessarily this or that should happen in your life before you give yourself permission to be who you want to be. And um, I'm a lucky guy. Uh, tremendously lucky. Um, that's not to say that I'm now living the perfect existence because the person that woke up on the floor seven weeks ago is the same person that went down to the floor. The difference is I now get the opportunity for a slightly different insight into where I want to go and what's going to stand in my way. We're always struggling. Even the people that might walk away from this podcast saying, oh, that's it. I'm going to do what I've always wanted to do. Where's that piano teacher? Where's my singing teacher? Where's that holiday that I'm going to take? Don't be too hard on yourself if you can't suddenly turn your life into that. But start thinking about it and stop thinking that we're going to be here forever. Really uh, valuable uh words there, Tony, um, and uh, great insight into uh, life and uh, not taking it for granted and living each day um, to the fullest, essentially doing what you love, um, you know, hanging out with people you love, uh, giving love, uh, receiving love and, yeah, just really um, embracing life for, for in its fullest uh, as opposed to, as you said, Taking it for granted and think you're going to be around, and one day you'll 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 uh, uh, you know do something that you want to do. Um, as you said, you know you need to uh, think. Well, 
you just don't know when that time's going to come. So, um, you know, live the dream as much as you can uh, and or work towards living the dream. So, uh, yeah, very valuable insight there, uh, Tony. Really appreciate you uh, sharing the story and, uh, um, you know, sharing all your um, experience around uh, men's mental health and mental health in general and uh, what people should do to be better support to others uh, around uh, in that mental health space. Uh, so certainly having that awareness, um, you know, being all ears, uh, not judging the person and uh, just, yeah, providing them the space uh, to share uh, and uh, and show you support by sitting in that space comfortably and listening uh, without jumping to um yeah mr fix it or uh you know problem solving mode uh so um have you got any further concluding words you'd like to uh leave the listeners with yeah look i suppose um if you're talking about mental health we're sort of relying on ourselves to come up with some answers maybe ask some questions and the mental health spectrum, or the, the, it goes from something very small to something very big. Something very small could be happening in your life that's quite big. Don't trust yourself and say it's just small. Something that you think is very big could be happening in your life, but the simple disclosure and consultation with someone can make that very small. Don't trust your judgment. And you know, Anthony, in those um, rooms that we were in, we often ask the question, is this better than therapy? And you remember, uh, without naming names, one of the participants in the room who was just going through different therapists uh, to find the right one. And just by talking about it, offered him the opportunity to think that maybe there was someone else that was better. So I suppose, you know, your, your first stop may, may not be your last stop. You might find someone who helps you a little bit, but you want someone who's going to help you a little bit more. There could be a personality clash. And I suppose that we... We came to the conclusion, I think you and I did, that both are good. Just having someone to talk to is good, but talking to a professional is also good. So don't try and work it out yourself. Take every opportunity to confide in people that are around you and look for other people that are around you that you might be able to help. And keep, keep pushing on to find your solution. It's there there if you if you look hard enough I suppose and what are your go-to resources Tony um, you know have, have you got particular apps or particular websites or um, people that you listen to or follow that really help you on your mental health journey look I just my great um, Opportunity for meditation comes at four in the morning when I wake up and I can't get back to sleep. Now, I don't know what goes on there. My brain just says, hey, we've had enough sleep here. Uh, let's get moving. And I say, it's only four o'clock. What are you talking about? So meditation helps me there. I'm an absolute um, failure when it comes to um, meditation, formal meditation during the day. But, you know, as I speak to you now, Anthony, I'm promising to myself that I'll do better in that regard. Um, look, my before I had before I fell over and collapsed, I was ex exceedingly fit, but not necessarily healthy. I was pushing it. I've always had exercise and food at the top of my regime and sleep, and I get each of those three. Uh, except when I can't go back to sleep at four o'clock, but generally I can after about half an hour, three quarters of an hour planning the day. So, um, yeah, exercise, right food and sleep. 
and meditate when you can. Awesome tips. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up there, Tony. I really appreciate your time. Uh, sharing all your experience and um, you know what works for you around mental health and what uh, helps the workplace uh, do mental health better uh, in terms of uh, find, finding that right fit of employee. Uh, it's been yeah great discussion, uh, very insightful, um, and it's always a delight and pleasure uh, talking to you, Tony. So um, thanks again. Oh, thanks for the opportunity, and, to the- and good luck in. Good luck to you. That's all right. And uh, to the listeners, uh, as as always, uh, thank you for listening in. Uh, If you've uh, certainly enjoyed the episode, please share it with others uh, to help them. And stay tuned for more insightful episodes of Me and My Health Up.